Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I'm Susan Linder, your host of the Innovation Storyteller Show. And today is going to be delicious. I'm so excited to have with me today the Director of Culinary Innovation at HelloFresh. I'm going to get into a whole recipe for fantastic innovation in amazing B2C companies, how we figure out the right recipe and the right ingredients for making innovation work. And I'm really excited about this. I'm a foodie. I don't know if any of you are foodies out there, but there's nothing that makes me happier than a perfectly prepared dish. Um, Or frankly, making what I just learned is I've been the envy of the folks on my floor of my apartment building because one of my not so positive traits is that I love to procrastinate bake. When I have a big task ahead of me and I don't want to actually do the work, I find a distraction in the kitchen and I just start procrastinating cooking or procrastinating baking. But as a single woman living in my own little apartment, no one needs a nine by 13 sheet pan of lasagna all to herself. So I find myself walking through my apartment building, handing out plates of lasagna to any of my neighbors who will take it. But it's become such a thing in my building that they just smell something, know I'm making too much of it, knock on my door. And so I'm just, this week is layers of breaded eggplant with pesto infused ricotta baked in the oven with a little mozzarella cheese, almost like an eggplant lasagna with some homemade fresh tomato sauce in between. And then, so on their way to walking their dogs, people just stop off and ask for a little puddle of eggplant lasagna this week. And that's what's been going on here in my apartment. So without further ado, I want to actually bring on a professional who gets to select the very cool ingredients, gets to really think about the innovations in our palate, but also our supply chain but also marketing and thinking about how we actually get amazing food into our home kitchens here in the U.S. and around the world. So please let me introduce you to Kristen Bryant. As I mentioned, she is the currently the culinary Director of Culinary Innovation at HelloFresh. She joined HelloFresh in the fall of 2021. And prior to that, Kristen had both a business and a culinary career managing sales and marketing teams for tech startups in San Francisco and Chicago, and eventually launching an online culinary media company. Who among us has not, Kristen, I ask you? Sure. (laughs) She also worked as a chef for a Walt Disney World signature restaurant, and in 2020 wrote and photographed a plant-based cookbook, Better Than Beef, for Macmillan Publishers. In her spare time, she loves to run with her Bozenji Willow with her Bazanji named Willow. Did I get that right? Basenji. Basenji. Yeah. Sorry, mm-hmm. cat cat girl here, not a dog. Yeah, dog. that's okay. <laughs> uh, and explore the NYC food scene with her fantastic husband. Who doesn't love doing that? I'm addicted to like all things food TikTok just because I want to explore new food experiences in my hometown. I had a fantastic experience. I had friends come visiting from out of town from Chicago and they bought tickets to a food tour of Chinatown. Now I am a native New Yorker. I have lived here my whole life and going on a food tour of Chinatown opened my eyes to history and culture and cuisines that I had no idea existed. Who knew there was a Michelin star dim sum house in Chinatown here in New York? No idea. Anyway, Kristen, I'm so excited to have you on this call with me. You can tell I'm a little animated about food, but welcome, welcome, welcome. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks. I love when people are animated about food. That's, that's, (laughs) it's my language. So I love it. (laughs) Yes. We should include a love language. It just says cook for me. Yes. (laughs) Fantastic. Okay. So tell us how you got here, Kristen. How did you get into the innovation of food, which is amazing? Yeah, I think it was really a part of me all along. It's just that it took certain life circumstances to to bring it out. And then when you realize there's so much innovation to be had, it's mind blowing. So, but I think the start of it was that I actually come from uh, a family where we all loved food. There, There weren't great cooks in our family, other than I could say maybe my grandmother, she made a great fried chicken, but you know, nobody was just 
enamored with food so much they spent all their time in the kitchen cooking. So I didn't really learn how to cook. My sister didn't either until we were out on our own. And basically when you're hungry, you're forced to figure it out. Um, so it, it was a long journey um, into food innovation, but it started with really just innovation in business. And I had some great mentors along the way, learned through working in several startups that innovation is key to the success of your business. And it's also important to the consumer. So in order to keep the consumer engaged and involved and really loving your product, innovation is just the primary driver. And so I just applied that when I got into the culinary world. I have to say working for Walt Disney World helped a lot because they are masters at innovation. Mm. And, and one of the things that I learned there was to not think about food as food. Think about it as an adventure, a journey, a journey for your senses. And it was an incredible learning ground for me. So I do owe a lot to my mentors at, at Walt Disney World, who I worked for. The, I worked for some amazing chefs there who gave me some insight into how to apply innovation to food. And I just brought it with me to HelloFresh. Is there anyone who doesn't find inspiration at Disney? I had Disney's senior illustrator on a couple of weeks ago. I've had other folks who lead up the Imagineering team. Mm. Like, it seems like it's such a fundamental part of the culture to do that. And I think it's the reason why people keep going back to mm. Disney parks and Disney experiences over and over again. And food has that kind of quality, right? We want simultaneously, we want comfort and recognition and we want traditional recipes. Like if you're even thinking about serving a pork roast on Thanksgiving, you might as well run for the door. Right. Yes. I mean, it's just that even if you don't like turkey, it had better be there. Right. right? Better be <laughs> on the table regardless. But we also love novelty. Like mm -hmm. it's the kind of thing where you love an old song, but you want to know if you go to the concert and you don't hear your favorite song from your favorite artist, you're going to be pointing. Yes. Mm -hmm. By the same token, you want to be constantly uplifted and be surprised. It's this surprise and comfort that we're simultaneously looking for in our palates, aren't we? We are. And innovation is definitely a part of that. But really, I, I encourage my team to think about food. And this is how I think about food as well. If you were to sit down, for example, and have a plate of something familiar, there's a story behind it. Right, like, like mac, mac and cheese. cheese. Okay, yeah. so mac and cheese. So if you sat down and had mac and cheese and you really started, let's say you had a pen and paper and you started writing down memories of your mac and cheese, where did those memories begin? Where was the first time you had mac and cheese? Why did you love it? What does it remind you of? What flavors in that mac and cheese make it so special? But why is it special? Well, it's special because... Most of the time, we are smelling and we're tasting at the same time. So those sensories are really working. But there's also, a, there's a story. There's a memory behind it. There's, oh, it's my grandmother used to make it for me. My mom used to make it for me. Or this is what I always had when I went to my best friend's house. My, it, it all of our development, I think here, is connected quite a bit to our recipe developers' memories, not just their culinary senses and their training, but their memories as well, because we're delivering this food to hundreds of thousands of homes across the US, and we want to bring their families together, their friends together, their, their, the people that they care most about together around the table, and we want to spark that beautiful memory, those sensories, even if it's not top of mind, it's still always there. You know, even if you don't actually articulate that, it's still there. It's comforting. It's familiar. And I think that's what brings us to food, back to food all the time. That's what people, I think that's what makes a foodie as well. Yeah. And the ability to articulate those stories, mm -hmm. right? It's something that's so powerful for us. I mean, 
I, you say the word school lunch and you automatically have a, a vision in your mind, right? right? You can see the tray, you know yep. what pizza Friday looked like. It was the mm-hmm. happiest day of the week. It was the only day I could cajole my mom to get a dollar for a school lunch, a dollar, yeah. right? Yeah. Otherwise I was brown bagging it the whole time, but like <laughs> something about that square of sauce and cheese that was not good. <laughs> but this is an innovation that you've been working on, right? You were doing school lunches with HelloFresh now too, right? We back to are school time. back mm-hmm. to school, right, right. We just yes. launched our back to school lunches and we have make ahead lunches for busy parents who would like to have items ready to go in their refrigerator. And then we also have same day lunch where you can just, it's easy. You can get it put together quickly and in the lunch box and out the door. So we're part of our innovation is making sure that we understand the jobs to be done of our customers and we understand what those are. How can we supply uh, what they need to get those jobs done? And one of them is what we've discovered is lunch. And so we, we started out primarily as here's a great way to make dinner. It's easy. It's fast. It's convenient. It's sustainable. But now we've broken into lunch and breakfast as well. So it's been, that's actually been a really fun journey this year is discovering how much our customers are enjoying having all of those options on our menu and they're delicious and convenient. So it's great. I only wish I had had that around when my kids were in school. (laughs) I would have loved to have had that (laughs) right there in front of me. It's amazing. These people want to eat three meals a day. Yeah. Isn't it? (laughs) Freaking insanity. It is. Yeah. Who made that rule? (laughs) So tell us about where it's an either an innovation that you've worked on, but also the stories that you need to tell to, to bring people on board was selling back to school lunches, a tough idea as the innovation team to the rest of the company or to the customers. You know what? We did a lot of research first to be Mm. sure that we our customers wanted it first of all, because we listened to them Um, quite a bit. I I mean, that's really what drives our innovation is is what our customers are looking for. So we did some research and found that we had customers who really would like to have that convenience. They were used to having it now for dinner. They would love it for lunches. And then we extended that to kids' lunches. So we've had great response. It wasn't as difficult of a task as it was really trying to make sure that we didn't overcomplicate it. We wanted to make sure we had familiar textures and flavors because we're talking about children and their palates aren't quite formed yet, but we also wanted to be sure to balance those meals and make sure that they were healthy and still fun. We have an amazing recipe developer who was tasked with all of these recipes and one of the things that she came up with, which I thought was really clever, was apple nachos. And and it's really just kind of a fun play on regular nachos, except that she chose to use apples, a few marshmallows, and a chocolate drizzle. And it was fun because sliced apple, it looked like nachos, but with apples. And I thought that's great because we, I mean, I, I think it's fun. It's healthy, has a little sweet great after-school snack as well. So with our make-ahead lunches, you get lunch and an after-school snack. So I think those fun things have been applied. And I asked her, I said, well, where, how did you come up with this? And she said, I loved having these kind of fun snacks when I was a kid. My mom would get really creative with after-school snacks for my brother and I, and we just it was one of the things that she would uh, put together was whatever she'd have in the cabinet. She'd throw it together and then she'd act as if it was this really big deal. (laughs) Oh, wow. Look what I made. All about the story. (laughs) That's right. So we're constantly drawing on those personal stories to create that, that innovation for our customers. And I really love that part about what we do. For the record, I would like mine with a small caramel drizzle and then some crushed up cinnamon toast crunch on top. 
That would make me super happy. Susan, I think we may have to have you in the test kitchen to do some innovating for us. That sounds amazing. Do not tempt me. I will be there. (laughs) But getting people on board either by price point or by conversation, right? Because this is an investment Mm -hmm. and a departure perhaps from just thinking about dinner for HelloFresh. Tell us a little bit about how you convey these ideas, especially around times where when times are tight. So for example, I'm curious what happened with your business, Kristen, during COVID. Was there an explosion of the desire for meal kits during that time? Or was this a time of economic questioning when people said, I don't know if I can invest in meal kit or I'm helping my kid all day with online school. And now I really need something that's going to make my life easier when I'm done pulling my hair out. I It did boom quite a bit. I think we we had meal kit adopters during COVID that perhaps would have never tried a meal kit before, simply because it was at the time safer than going out to the grocery store. It was delivered directly to your door. The other thing that I think what I feel really good about is that we have some food deserts in the U.S. and it was amazing to see our teams, our fulfill, our fulfillment teams and our distribution centers really pulled together at the increase in orders to get those boxes shipped out to folks and individuals who they might have to drive 30 minutes to a grocery store. And they there were meals in a box and everything's pre-measured. There's no waste. Everything is put together perfectly for that particular meal. You can choose your serving size. So I think during COVID, it did boom. And of course, when folks were able to go back to the grocery store, I think we leveled out like everyone did, but we're still seeing those adopters come back to us and realizing, hey, this was so convenient. I think we're going to keep it up. The The other flip side to that is, I think we did have some individual or some customers who at first thought, oh, this is a luxury. It's not something I should purchase on a regular basis because it's expensive. And when you actually do the math, it's less expensive than when you go to the grocery store and purchase all of the ingredients for those dishes. The other thing that you're doing is, which I think is quite innovative, is that we're keeping food fresher longer because everything's individually pre-portioned. And Mm. so, you know, when you buy something at the grocery store and you need a tablespoon of it for a recipe, and then it sits in your refrigerator and four months later, you realize it's back in the corner and you throw it away. And it's unfortunate. Yeah, we all are. We all are. So this was, I think this was something that our customer base realized, hey, this is not only helping me with my food budget, but it's keeping food on the table. It's convenient. And I, it's making life a little less complicated and I'm doing something sustainable for the environment. So uh, it was a win. And I honestly, I think that those were the comments that resonated most with me during that time. And the, the customers were really surprised. So, and I recall, I mean, I think we all do thinking about supply chain issues and you mm-hmm. saw all of those ships outside of the ports, especially on the West coast. And How much of that for your own innovation portfolio and recipe development, when you're looking at sourcing some incredible ingredients, I'm sure HelloFresh has a tremendous sourcing team, Mm -hmm. but how do you take into account when you really want to begin to innovate your recipe profile? And I think this is for all of us when looking at supply chain issues, whether you're in massive manufacturing or whether you're, you know, a smaller, fast moving startup, how does that balance take place with global sourcing or thinking about just the really awesome ingredient you want to put in the next dish and and the global supply chain? I can say that it's carefully crafted Mm. among several cross-functional teams within our organization. And it is a very meticulous and meticulously executed initiative to make sure that we are sourcing ingredients that are perfect for these dishes, delight our customers, but are also going to be delivered in a manner where they're fresh, 
and they're usable and it doesn't always go well because that's just the way things happen. But most of the time I have to give our procurement team credit for really doing a fantastic job of making sure that we're sourcing quality ingredients and that they're getting to their to our customers in a timely manner. But we also are very conscious of seasonal ingredients. So you'll notice that there are times when you can't get a recipe that has a certain kind of lettuce. You won't be able to see a recipe with, I mean, you might find less recipes with tomatoes outside of summer. We, there are times we'll ban certain vegetables for a month or two, and we don't let recipes on the menu with those vegetables because it's just a quality issue. We want to make sure that our customers are giving the finest quality available. And when it's out of season, it could potentially not be. So um, we're very careful about that. And I, I, again, have to give credit to our procurement team for being very conscientious in that area. Yeah. Which I imagine it's not easy, right? You get really excited about Mm -hmm. a menu and then you're like, (laughs) not going to happen. Oh, yes. I mean, even our recipe developers are like, no, I want to be able to use this type of zucchini or, and, and so, or we'll actually create the recipes with those ingredients and we just won't be able to run them on the menu for a while because they're out of season. So yeah, it's a very finely tuned system. Hmm. For sure. Well, my my latest joy is going to my farmer's market and picking up a vegetable I've never seen before and then figuring oh, out something yes. to do with it. So that eggplant dish I mentioned at the beginning was I had never seen Dominican eggplant before. Mm-hmm. And it's a purple and white speckled eggplant. And I was like, what in the what is this? Yeah. And so I asked my Dominican friends, I was like, I didn't even knew, know, first of all, have you heard of a Dominican eggplant? Because maybe it's some Dominican friar <laughs> from Italy in the 15th century or something that crossbred this particular type of eggplant. But, and so I, I didn't know that all these Dominican eggplant dishes existed. And I was like, wow. I also found out for some of my friends, it was like the torturous dish you had to eat because you had to get your vegetables in as a kid when you really yeah. just to have something far more delicious, like fried chicken. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that seasonality around the mm-hmm. chain can be really challenging too. And so do you, where's the conflict or where's the challenge that exists sometime for you in, in bringing innovations to the market or even within the organization where it's like, this is a challenge, like this is where the rub is. Is it around ingredients in your innovation portfolio or is about, is it something else about thinking two, three, five years ahead of what the future of HelloFresh looks like? I think there's a, there, there are some challenges around the type of ingredients that we would like to use in our dishes. And if you think about scaling the number of meals with one particular ingredient, you have to have that ingredient in that large quantity. So we often have multiple suppliers because we are very careful about the type of quality that we source. So we may source a certain amount from growers across certain areas um, of the U.S. and the globe. But I think that is maybe where some of our, I wouldn't say conflict, but some of the most difficult situations we might have as develop as a development part of our organization is saying, oh, I mean, we're chefs, all of us, and recipe developers. So we, if we could source ramps, I love ramps and ramp season. Love ramps. I love fairy tale eggplant, which is the little tiny ones. I mean, it would be great to source those all the time. We can't. Um, so we have a great team that is dedicated to working with us directly to find these ingredients. And they may show up on the menu just certain times of the year, which makes it special for our customers. So we could we couldn't possibly do it all of the time because you just can't have those products in season you know, 12 months out of the year. So there there is some challenge there on a regular basis and it is a conversation that we have every single day. Uh, mm. because that because we're a food organization. I mean it is about the food. So this is a regular conversation and we're constantly testing and tasting uh products um 
we're constantly iterating on new sauces, um, convenient sauces, so that perhaps a customer doesn't have to create their own sauce in a dish. It could just be something that they could open a package and pour it into their meal. Um, so it's, it is a consistent conversation that we're having on a regular basis. And it includes some challenging conversations, I'm sure. Um, we have a, a term in our uh, team called creative abrasion, and it's directly taken from Linda Hill's book, Collective Genius. I absolutely love her work. And I based a lot of our innovation training on her book. And one of the things that she talks about is creative abrasion. And I love discussing that and giving our team the opportunity to innovate, but to say exactly how they feel about either a dish or a particular ingredient, and then making that a safe space to say, I didn't like that and here's why, or I don't think we should use it and here's why, and have another person say, but I do feel we should use it because this is why. And they can bring their business case forward. And then we can have this really constructive conversation about the best possible way to develop, construct, and finalize this meal. And I've never so heard of creative abrasion before. It sounds fascinating. So oh, it's you're not it coming is. in with sandpaper and just wearing each other down until someone's no. like uncle. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what's happening. No, no. I mean, it's a, it's a very important part of our innovative process. And I like it because everyone feels very comfortable stating how they feel about a dish because a lot of um, our work is feedback. And it's internal feedback at the tasting table. It's, and you want to have a, you want to have psychological safety there. You want to make sure that you feel comfortable saying, no, I don't think that this is going to work, but here's why. Or I would do something different here. And you do have to set ground rules. Um, you have to be able to have very informal conversation and everybody needs to feel very comfortable with that, uh, giving and receiving feedback. Yeah. It was funny. I was watching a set of interviews with Seth Meyers from the Seth Meyers late night talk show host, mm -hmm. but prior to that being the head writer at SNL. Mm -hmm. And he would talk about these table reads of people introducing new ideas. And so we had all these writers on talking about the ideas that never got through. And I mean, some of them were just absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. And he's sitting there interviewing a writer and then you hear Seth Meyers' own audience's reaction, which is crickets. And he's like, and that is why we never made that skit. Like we never did that skit. Right. And so I don't imagine though, you come to the kitchen at HelloFresh with all of these incredibly trained chefs and you take a big ladle full and go, <laughs> and there's just this look of like disgust and that's never going to work, right? There's a whole lot more negotiation process yeah. around what each subjective mouth is feeling around mm -hmm. a particular dish. So how do you get, what, what's the compass, I guess, Kristen, that you said around the word innovation at HelloFresh? Like, is it just something new or are you taking us to a different place? Both actually. Uh -huh. And I believe that when we we're ideating, I don't think there are any bad ideas. So I always say, I and mean, of course, Seth Meyers would disagree with me here. There, there probably are bad ideas. <laughs> yeah, there are bad ideas, but I don't want anyone to think that there are bad ideas because uh, let's just get out. Let's just get in there. Let's just think about these ideas. And we typically, there, there's a formula that we use. There's a culinary brief with a concept. And so we do develop based on those concepts. And they have been ideated before we even get them. And it and they've gone through several iterations based on our customer insights. Uh, so we, we're very clear and we're very data-driven. So everything we do is, is data-driven. I know that takes some of the, I don't know, I don't think it sounds very food sexy to say data, but it's, we are it is data to this audience, by the way, yeah. <laughs> we, love the data. we love all the data. <laughs> oh yeah. We live and die by it because it's important to understand what our customers want. And so if the data is there, then we formulate that concept. And then we basically go into a room and we brainstorm 
these dishes. And I believe there is just, no, there are no bad ideas. Let's just put them out there. Let's figure this out. And then let's start narrowing them down. Let's look at the data and let's figure out what does this dish do and, and what job does it do for our customer? What, what does it meet? What need does it meet? Let's make sure that we have that data to match up with that. And so there is a, a very, I wouldn't say arduous process, I would say more meticulous process that we go through. So nothing gets on the menu that was just, hey, we just think this is a great idea. It's very specifically on the menu because our data says it should be there. And then the concepts though, are innovated through our recipe developers really discussing flavor profiles. And we also have to think about how the customer is going to create that dish and what does it take for our customer to create that dish? And do, does it need to be more convenient or is it okay if it's a 45 minute meal? So there's just all kinds of considerations on the table. Hmm. And this whole idea around jobs to be done, I right? Clay Christian and, mm-hmm. and- this idea around innovation. We talk about a lot on this show is what comes after that, after jobs to be done, because, okay, job is done, but job to be done and reliability, fantastic. Doesn't necessarily translate just to customer loyalty. It's like, oh, that was easy. That was simple. Mm -hmm. But the joy of it, right? I mean, the food Mm -hmm. brings so much joy in its own right, but the job to be done is also the smile, the brand recognition, the reorder, the re-upping. And so I'm curious about when you're innovating, how are you anticipating the next job to be done, right? Mm -hmm. Is it, does it become like the HelloFresh dinner party? And, or do you want your guests, do you want your, your customers to publicize the fact that they use HelloFresh or are they more excited to say, ta-da, I did it myself. Nobody has to know about (laughs) HelloFresh. Mama did it all by herself. Yeah, I'm glad you... I'm glad you asked the question that way because it, the data gives us the jobs to be done. But what I want, and I know my team wants, is for the the customer to really find the joy in what we innovated. And so I think they go hand in hand. I think we can give them a product that meets their need and helps them get that job done, which is a busy parent getting food on the table quickly, or somebody who really isn't used to cooking, but really wants to have a lovely dinner for a friend. And we can do both. We can give you both. And you can get this incredible amount of joy out of that because essentially you've brought people you care about around the table. And sometimes it's not even just about the food. It's about that food really promoted this conversation and it promotes communication and human interaction. And so the the beauty of what we innovate really creates this domino effect and brings humans together. It does fill a need, but then there's also this other beautiful thing that comes out of it. And uh, quite frankly, that's really why we all come to work every day, because we know that's impacting the lives of so many of our customers. Yeah. When I think about it, I had an intense aversion to cooking when I was younger. So in Mm my twenties, I swore on my feminist self that I would not learn to cook. (laughs) I kept my tax returns in the oven in case my building in my fourth floor walk up in case my building burned down. And I used to dust my stove. I ate out three meals a day, every day (laughs) until I married a man with two children. And then I realized we could not eat out three meals a day every day. And yes. the Food Network <laughs> taught me how to cook because oh, I did not know love how that. To- I had the chance. I was watching aerobics and I was watching the Food Network. And I ultimately sided with you <laughs> with the Food Network <laughs> to my own detriment. But anyway, <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> but, you know, it's you know, when you just needed to figure out something, but then over time, the process of cooking became such a joy. And it was the result of seeing smiles around the table. That was my impetus to keep going. Yeah. And And I feel like when you have meal kits like this, you have the Mm -hmm. opportunity to get the whole family involved. Mm -hmm. 
my mom was always like, oh, you don't know what you're doing. So step out of the kitchen. Let me do it. So I didn't learn that way. And it wasn't a joy. It was a drudgery. Mm. But it was amazing yeah. over time of watching. It's a, it's something about cooking, right? That is the joy is in the giving that eventually you learned, oh, the joy is also in the ingredients. The joy is also in the shopping and the selection, the joy. You, you find all these other layers of joy in it, mm -hmm. which it seems like this business has the opportunity to kind of even innovate how we think about the layers of joy in the cooking and the preparation. Oh, agree with you completely. And I, I think it's, it is actually, it's, it, it helps us when we think about it that way. It does help us ideate new ways to provide food to our customers. And you said dinner party earlier. We're going to be bringing dinner parties. No, uh, I just meals. made that up. <laughs> no, we really are in 2024. So look out for that. That's going to be so much fun. Yes. So I think that's where I always find joy. I, I always tell my family, we'll say, she's the only person we know who likes to go to the grocery store. I really do. It, that's like a carnival for me. I mean, yeah. that's Walt Disney World for me. Um, I love going to the grocery store. I could spend hours just going through each aisle, looking at all of the unique ingredients that I could maybe make something with at home. But yeah, we we want to bring the, that kind of joy to our customer, but make it make it simple enough that they have uh, this really beautiful recipe card. It's well-written. It, the instructions are all there. We have a timeline. We actually did that for our Thanksgiving box, which comes out in the next month or two. You could pre-order it. And we have all of our uh, Thanksgiving sides, plus the turkey or a prime rib. And when we were developing it, we just sat around the table and thought, okay, let's think through a typical Thanksgiving day for the person who actually creates the meal or is hosting the, the dinner. And what can we do to make their life a little more simple, but yet bring joy to into their kitchen while they're doing this task, which we've all been there. Sometimes you're sweating and it's you're worried the turkey's not done and the how am I going to put the green beans in the oven? And so we have this really great pamphlet that we put together and it gives you steps from the night before when to start prepping everything. So it's all simply put together. You just have to read it, make sure you follow the instructions and your day will be very well constructed and you won't be stressed. So I, I just think forget that first Thanksgiving that I cooked yeah. I had my finger on like nine, one, just ready yeah. to hit my face. <laughs> like someone died from whatever it is. I, I had. And I will never forget. It. I, I walked outside to get some sage leaves to put on the platter for my beautiful Turkey that oh. I had made. And I walked in and there was my brother-in-law eating a drumstick before I had served it on the table. Oh. And I was like, I had never felt murderous rage in my life, but it was there. <laughs> like I had not worked so hard in my whole life. I'm like, pretty good. I'm like, <laughs> oh, I think my biggest fear was cooking the turkey that was in Christmas vacation where it was so dry. <laughs> People are just cr crunching on the bones. And I do remember my first turkey. I was very young. I think right out of college and it was quite dry. I hadn't really learned to cook then. It was quite dry, but after years of experimenting, I feel like I've got it down now, but that was, that was horrifying. Yeah. Thank you, Alton Brown, for teaching me the word brine, which I had oh, never I know. heard of before in my life. That right? was a game changer. So oh. what, what advice do you have for as you think about your time in innovation coming all the way from Disney to now, and wh what do you think about, like, what's something that you've learned along the way that you might want to share with our audience about innovation in this particular space? Innovation in this particular space, in meal kits, is really a combination of intuition and really understanding what brings you personal joy and then combining that with your skills and the data that our company has been able to put together. So it that's actually a story right there. So if you take the data 
and you apply that to your intuition about the food and your skill set that you have and start thinking through what it means to eat that food and create that food and who would be at that table. And I mean, you, you put that story together and then you innovate. And so I think for me, I, I learned early on when I was working at Disney that it's not always just about the, it's not always black and white. You, you have that as your basis, but think outside of that and think about something that would give you an experience, something that's memorable, something that would provide you with, with something to talk about after it's over. It leaves you with a memory. It leaves you with an experience and it leaves you with a feeling. And I took that and brought that with me here. And I think everyone on our team is feels the same way. So innovation is really combining all of those things together, using that data, and then taking that creativity to put something together that is delicious and brings joy and brings humans together around a table. Fantastic. All right. So it's time for our hot seat questions here on the innovation storyteller show. Okay. So gonna... in an, so tell us what you think is the greatest innovation of all time, Kristen. KitchenAid stand mixer. What could it be? <laughs> what is yeah, it? I've got some light here. Um, yeah. let's see. It's uh, the greatest innovation of all time. Ooh. Yeah, maybe come a little closer to your screen so we could see you. Your yeah, sorry about that. I, I've got a lot of sun coming in this window. Hold on one second. <laughs> um, there we go. Yeah, let me do that one more time. So, Kristen. Tell us, what do you think is the greatest innovation of all time? Ooh, the greatest innovation of all time. I would have in the course say, history, yeah. In the course of human history. Oh, wow. Um, I'd have to say, I would have to say probably a peeler. I know that sounds ridiculous, but I, you can do so many things. And I'm coming from a food perspective. I can, you can do so many things with a peeler and I, I know. Educate so, me. I'm, I would love to know. <laughs> yeah. So we, it's really fun to make vegetable curls. So you could make a whole salad if you have the time by just peeling, getting a peeler and peeling a zucchini, peeling a carrot. You can peel eggplant. You can peel jicama. You can peel, I mean, anything, any like hard vegetable and it makes this really gorgeous salad. You could peel a beet and make a beet carpaccio. It's beautiful because you're just shaving small pieces of raw beet and you can put it in some lemon juice, olive oil, salt, and pepper, and then it looks gorgeous on a plate with some greens and goat cheese. I mean, the peeler does everything. I love a peeler, a good peeler. I mean, I invest in a good peeler. Yeah. So that for me, it's simple, but I love that. And I love the baby Cuisinart because you uh -huh. can make pesto and all kinds of little dressings really fast in, in that little one. And by New York City, there's no um, space. <laughs> there's no space. So I get mileage out of that little baby Cuisinart. I have a small, I have an addiction to small appliances. So <laughs> I'll, I'll put anything in a waffle maker, but um. yeah, oh, right. I mean, awesome. That's great, actually. Yeah, that works. Yeah. That works. Sweet potato latkes may be coming this week in a waffle Ooh, maker. So much what fun. a great idea! Yeah. Great. Okay, we could do this all day. Okay, so next question is: Tell us what you think if you could join any innovation team. In the course of human history, we're trying to dispel the notion that innovation is a one woman show. Mm. So what team would you have wanted to have been on that produced something amazing? I always wanted to be a Disney Imagineer, or I would have wanted to work for Ed Catmull at Pixar. I think Any it particular would've... film you would have wanted to work on? Oh, Up. Up, I love up. up. Great movie. Great movie. Yes. That was probably one of my favorites, but yeah, Pixar, 
I mean, I'm a huge Ed Catmull fan, so go read his book. It's amazing as well. And I think I met several Disney Imagineers and the restaurant that I worked in for Walt Disney World was created by one of their first Imagineers. And it was just spectacular. And the attention to detail was phenomenal. And the level of warmth that it exuded and adventure that it exuded was just beyond imagination. I mean, it was just so creative. And so I, I, yeah, those two innovative teams probably would be my goal, but I'm not an engineer, so they would never hire me, but, but it would be fun. That's what you can reimagine yourself in anything. So yes. yes. um, And then finally, what's something you wish would be invented? Something that drives you crazy or something that you just wish would exist for all humanity that would make everyone so happy. What do you wish for Ooh, I wish for that's a good question Susan what innovation um, would you love to see in the world that doesn't yet live here there's so many things but yeah I used to think that it'd be great to have someone go get your groceries but we have that now mm. but it would probably be wow I can't even think of anything that is a really good question you stumped me because I really I talk all the time I have no <laughs> Usually have no loss for words, but that's really great. I don't know. I don't know. I have to think about that. Maybe you'll invent a far better peeler than the one we're currently using. (laughs) It's a gadget that requires serious upgrade. That's right. I know. But nothing pisses me off more than a superfluous kitchen gadget. Like no one needs an avocado scraper, right? I mean, like a knife is going to do the job. Yeah, right. Maybe it's the elimination of a dearth of useless kitchen gadgets. I know. Would be helpful to the market and to cooks who feel intimidated, right? Young right. cooks intimidated. Yeah. yeah. I would like, I would, I, I could say this. I would love to have a knife that I didn't have to sharpen all the time. Ooh, that yeah. would be amazing. That would be amazing. I think that was the one thing my chefs at the restaurant that I cooked at Tiffin's, my chef would, my head chef would always come around and say, Kristen, is your knife sharp? <laughs> I was like, yes, chef. And I'd go sharpen it really quick. So, but you know, when you use it a lot, even the best knife, you have to keep it sharpened. So it would be nice to have a, sh- a self-sharpening knife. knife. Yeah. I mean, we do it here. We have to have it prof- our knives prof- professionally sharpened a lot. From your lips to God's ears, a shelf yes. sharpening knife. Amen. <laughs> Kristen, Brian, if people want to get in touch with you, what is the best way to do that? They can reach me on LinkedIn. I'm easily approachable on LinkedIn and um, at my email here at HelloFresh. So, but LinkedIn is probably the best way to reach out. Fantastic. Kristen Bryant, Director of Innovation at HelloFresh. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Susan. It was a pleasure. Me too. (laughs) 